Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz alto saxophonist Richie Cole. He grew up in Trenton, New Jersey, and would always dream of being a jazz cat. These days, he lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and is digging the release of the 2016 album called Richie Cole Plays Ballads and Love Songs. He loves Pittsburgh, and he's a happy cat. His early influences were Sonny Rollins and Charlie Parker, and he got his start in the jazz journey by getting a scholarship from the Downbeat magazine to the Berkeley College of Music. And that got him out of the Vietnam War. He was baptized well in the early years by being in the Buddy Rich Big Band, Lionel Hampton's Big Band, and Doc Severinsen's Big Band as well. And over 50 albums and CDs later, he's played with the best in the business, like Bobby Enriquez, Freddie Hubbard, Sonny Stitt, Art Pepper, Tom Waits, Boots Randolph, Nancy Wilson, and the list continues to go on and on. He's a very happy soul, full of bravado, so dig this interview, my friends. Richie, hey, it's an honor to speak with you. Thank you for taking some time out to talk with me here at Neon Jazz. I appreciate it. My pleasure. No problem, man. So let's go ahead and start off here. I know you got the new album. I got it. I really did it. I just want to kind of get an idea, a snapshot in your own words. What has been going on with you lately? Well, I moved to Pittsburgh two and a half years ago, and it was uh, the best move I ever made in my life. I, I just fell in love with this town, and they fell in love with me, and I got, I got um, a good bunch of guys. I got... I got my I have my own record company, RCP, which is called Possess Records. Um recording up two two recording studios I work at. I'm recording my Alto Mandis Orchestra, which I've been doing for twenty years, but um, I got a, a good Pittsburgh Alto Mandis Orchestra, which is uh my little four horn band, four horns, uh trumpet, alto, tenor, trombone, and rhythm section. And I, I, I do all of the arranging and say I I get it to sound like an eighteen piece big man with the four horns. That's kind of a secret style I developed. I'm working a lot around here. That ne- next, um, I'm still going to travel a lot. I'm actually more than I, I want to, uh, but I have to go to uh, Charleston, South Carolina Thursday for five days and opening up a new jazz club down there. I'll be back. And, uh, geez, there's so much happening. I'm doing a big Christmas show in, in December with the, 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 the Children of the Madness, uh, 200, 4th, 5th, and 6th year old kids singing with my orchestra and, uh, uh, it's, uh, and uh, this is the Palace album. Just, well, it says on the, you know, the public tells the story. We, 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 I, I didn't even know where it was going to be anything. If I, if I knew it was uh, going to be going to, uh, developed into something, I would have uh, given it a little more thought. But we just uh, played some ballads, and it came out pretty good just by uh, not thinking about it. So that's kind of what happened there. But anyway, I'm very happy here. My, my daughter and grandkids brought me here two and a half years ago, and I got a nice place to live, and uh, I couldn't be any happier. I wrote a song called uh, I Have a Home in Pittsburgh, and Indeed, Indeed. Wonderful. That would be perfect. Mm-hmm. You know, the one thing I always hear about all these cities, you know, you hear about Kansas City and L.A. and New York and Boston, but you don't hear about Pittsburgh. So what what's going on with the scene there? Well, there's a real good jazz scene here. In fact, Pittsburgh is historically a big jazz town. I mean, so many people came out of here, starting with my partner, Eddie Jefferson, George Benson, R. Blakey, the, the, the list goes on and on. I mean, a lot of people came out of Pittsburgh. It's always been a good jazz town. I've, I've been hanging out of Pittsburgh since the 60s when I was with the Buddy Rich Band. You know, we, when we played in New York and we go to Chicago or Cleveland, the, Pittsburgh is always a stop on the way, so we used to stop here all the time. And uh, um, I, I've, I've always had a lot of friends here, but now i got a, a whole family of friends here. You know, Pittsburgh is a, has always been a major jazz town. Let me ask you this. Your latest album plays ballads and love songs. Talk to me about this album. Take me in the studio. Why did this come out so good? Well, it came, well, I think it tells a story on the record. We, uh, I was, it was supposed to be a session for my, my little big band, the Alto Mantis Orchestra, and then the, the guys uh, at the last minute got, got, got something else on the road or something and they couldn't show up. So I, I was there with a the, with the trio and just me. So it was Mark's idea. Well, I mean, let's just record ballads. I said, all right, as long as we're here. That was pretty much the, the, the whole thought process, process for it. Yeah, as long why not? As long as I'm here, let's play a couple of ballads. And it, that's what came out. How does a kid from Trenton, New Jersey, pick up the sax and have such a long story career in jazz like you have? <laughs> well, my, my dad owned a, a jazz club in Trenton. He actually owned two clubs, the, the Harlem Club, which is a, a jazz club, and then he owned one called Hubby's Inn, which is a like a Las Vegas showroom. He used to have Louis Prima, Keely Smith, the Trenears, all the all the, the, the Vegas acts there. And then the jazz club, he had Sonny Stitt, Clark Terry, Coleman Hoffman, blah, 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 and a uh, bunch, bunch of guys right there. I was just a baby at the time. I didn't really 
experience, some vague memories of being down there. But uh, he had, but in any case, uh, somebody left, left an alto saxophone with him. So I, I grew up with an alto saxophone all my life in the house. I just go open up as a little kid and look, look at it and push the button. Oh, that button pushes that button down. Wow, how about that? Boom, boom, boom. And I started playing when I was about five. And then uh, my, my, my fingers couldn't couldn't reach the button. So I, I quit for a while for my fingers to grow. And I got serious about it when I was 10. And I've been playing ever since. So it, it, one question I would like to ask is what albums really were influential, but you, you saw all these people come through the club. Were there any albums in addition to that that really got you going? I know Charlie Parker and Sonny Rollins were big influences for you, but what, who really moved your brain into that jazz mode? Charlie Parker and Sonny Rollins. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, my, my mom always had, like, that, uh, first of all, I didn't come from a musical family. My dad was a businessman. He was a musician. But I was I was actually raised by my stepfather who worked in a factory and my mother was a waitress, so I didn't have really any any musical input from my family. But my mom had uh, some Glenn Miller records and there was a Count Basie record in there. I don't know how that got in there, but then I used to, was I've always been attracted to the big band sound, and I, that's why I, I, I was uh, fortunate enough to work with Buddy Rich and Milo Hampton and Doc Severinsen, and uh, for going out on my own with with my Alto Mandis group. But, uh, no, I, I just, it was just, and when I was a kid, I used to listen to the, the, the uh, jazz station from New York and Philadelphia all night long. You know, they, they, that's when they were playing real jazz, and uh, I'd stay up all night, and I'd get like, three hours of sleep before I had to get up to school. But every night, after watching Johnny Carson, I used to listen to the, listen to the jazz station until like three or four in the morning. So I just heard a lot of jazz. I was, for, for some reason, I don't have the answer either. For some reason, I've, I was always fascinated with jazz, I always knew all my life that that was what I was going to do in my life was to play play saxophone and, and to be in the, be uh, in the music business. I always knew it. I never even doubted it. Beautiful. You know, it's funny. You you hit me at a particular time where I just interviewed Terry Gibbs, the great vibes vibes guy, and oh, yeah. I read his bio and he was he had a story in there about how he would drive in Buddy's Cadillac and get him stoned before they would go to a new show <laughs> right. to mellow him out so he would be easier on the boys. And I guess he picked, <laughs> so he picked up on what Terry was doing and kicked him out of his car in the middle of the desert. And Terry's definitely afraid of snakes. And Terry said he almost rearranged that dude when he got to town. So oh every, time I, every time I hear Buddy... And he had real rich stories about Benny Goodman, too. I just, yeah. my entire perception of those guys, which are legends, has a more yeah. human persona to it. So, anyway. Um, uh, well, 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 wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's why, when did you talk to Terry Gibbs? Uh, about three weeks ago. Uh, I, I was just with him uh, about two months ago. They, they, the uh, L.A. Jazz to put on a, 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 a tribute to Buddy, Buddy Rich, Buddy Rich Reunion concert, Reunion Band, which I was in the Buddy Rich Reunion Band. And okay. Terry Gibbs has Terry Gibbs Gibbs had a, a band out there, and I I, I opened the the Buddy Rich reunion band with my alto Manus orchestra. Richie called me alto Manus orchestra. That was quite a thrill for me opening for my old boss's band, you know. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, John, Johnny Mandel had a band there. It was like you know everybody was anybody with big band. It was, it was a real it was a real real thrill being being in in the company in their company and be on that show. Let me ask you this. The one thing that's really cool that I dig is that you got a full scholarship from Downbeat to go to Berkeley. That had to be a really cool thing. Oh, it was great, man. It, it, it saved me from going to Vietnam. Wow. It was a very cool thing. <laughs> yeah, man. I was like, you know, I I came from a, you know, not a poor family, but, you know, not, we didn't have money to send me to college. So, like, I, I just entered the contest. It's the only, only thing I've ever won in my life was a full scholarship to college, which I'll, I'll, I'll say, hey, I don't need to win anything anymore. That's fine. I, I was actually um, ready to join the, 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 the Navy band out of, out of high school, so I didn't have to go, uh, you know, fight. But uh, there's no guarantee about that either. But uh, So I didn't have to. So I got a deferment when, uh, for the first year going to Berkeley, and then the second year, they give they, they, they me, they, they, they let, just let me stay. They let me stay there for nothing. And uh, sure. the second year that the Army came after me again, and uh, but I was with Buddy's band at the time. He, he didn't want to lose me. He, he took me to his, his doctor in Beverly Hills. I had heart murmurs, slack speed, half of a liver, no no kidney. You know, he had me like... <laughs> <laughs> so when you were with Buddy Rich, 
What did you learn? To be around a, a guy like him that had such clout, you had to have grown exponentially with him. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I learned, um, well, I had, I had, well, here's what I learned. I learned discipline, and I learned how to be a fan leader. He taught me how to be a fan leader. And the reason why we got along so well, I was there for two and a half years, is because I did my job, I minded my own business, and I treated him with the respect that he deserved. So we got along the side. Perfect. And then you also gigged with the Lionel Hampton Big Band and Doc Severinsen Big Band. What did you learn with those guys? What was that like? They didn't really teach me anything else, but as Buddy, Buddy and Eddie Jefferson taught me how to be a pro. Lionel Hampton was a gig, you know, it was just playing, it was a big band gig. I didn't think, it, was, it wasn't nearly as good as the band as Buddy Rich Band. In fact, there were no bands as good as the Buddy Rich Band. Yeah, Count Basie had yeah, did his style, but I mean, he was, you know, he's Count Basie. But all the other bands had, but you, you could not follow the Buddy Rich Big Band. It was just too dynamic. So uh, then when I went with Lionel Hampton, he was kind of like very relaxed. He didn't have any charts. And we had we end the show marching through the audience, play the Saints, go marching in. It was like, yeah, but Buddy's been, bam, we're hitting that, hitting that serious shit, man, great charts. You know, you've, you've had over 50 albums, been on over 50 albums in your yeah. career, 50 plus. You've played with all kinds of people. I mean, Tom Waits, Art Pepper, Boots Randolph, and all of the big bands. What what have you not done that you really want to do with your career? What what's on your horizon? Or are you just doing your thing? No, no, no. I, well, I'm continuing uh, working with my own. Keep, keep recording with my Alto Manus Orchestra. In fact, after the first of the year, there's a, a CD coming out called the, the the Many Minds of Richie Gall on RCP Records with my Alto Manus Orchestra. And before Thanksgiving, I, I a couple of weeks ago, I just finished my my first Christmas album. So that's that'll be out this year before Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, it's called that. Have yourself an alto madness Christmas. I'm excited. I'm excited about that. What I'd like to do uh, down the line, I would like to uh, record with a symphony orchestra. I certainly would like to do that. And uh, a few months ago, about six months ago, I, I, I just came out with my, my record, book, Vocal Madness, with my vocal group in D.C. So I did that already. Very good vocal. You know, the one thing, too, is, you know, you've arranged also for big bands. How do you how do you do that playing and the arranging? How do you kind of coordinate those styles, those phases of who you are as a musician? Well, when I'm not playing, I'm I'm writing. It's just it's it's part of the whole whole package, you know. It's just I see I I, I get up two thirty in the morning. And I write all day, man, until like late at night, and that's all I do. I'm like I'm like a, like a maniac here. I just I'm, I'm writing right now. Right on. And, uh, then when it comes time to do a gig, I get my one, go to play a gig, come back, and start writing some words. It's all, it's all the same, you know. So talk to me about the Alto Madness Orchestra. Talk to me about the history and how you feel about it. I told you I, I was, I've always been attracted to the big band sound. I played in a lot of big bands, but the last thing I, I, I want or need to deal with is 18, 18 crazy musicians that have to keep you in line and show up on time and you know, be in the right condition. Okay. All right. So I, I figured, I figured out a way instead of having twelve horns. In my arranging, to, to get basically the same sound with only four horns, you know, just by experimentation. I, I, I've been doing this for over 20 years now, the Alto Manus Orchestra, and I, I just, I just love it. That's that's that, that's what I'm happiest when I when I have my orchestra. I, I love playing it, you know, the quartets and going around and doing. I, I, I love it both, but I, I, I really like. I, I think the reason I like the orchestra because I, I, I can hear what I wrote. I can hear the, the arrangements I wrote. I mean, I, when, I'm, when I'm writing it on the paper, I can hear it in my head. I know exactly what it sounds like in my head, but to actually hear it, you know, that's a real thrill. So, you know, who are your jazz heroes? Oh, man, I have, I have so many. I, it, that, I've been very, very lucky in, in, in a couple ways. Uh, I've been very fortunate in that I, I call it the, the tail end of the big band era in, in the, with Buddy Rich in the late 60s. Because there are big bands around now, but... It wasn't like they were working in big bands back then, traveling in, around the world. You know, Count Basie, you know, Duke Ellington, Buddy Rich, uh, Man Ferguson. They, they were they were like you know just after and you know we were on we were on the road ten months out of the year, you know, constantly on the road for two and a half years. Yeah, I got a chance, to, uh, and so like I said, I I, I I caught the tail end of the big band big band era. I feel very lucky about that. Also, I feel very lucky about at least at least getting to meet and know, if not perform with, my childhood heroes. Like Sonny Rollins, you know, and we Sonny Stick and I worked together, Freddie Hubbard and I worked together, I mean, um Manhattan Transfer. You know, the people who I've I've always admired, but actually um 
you know, actually we break, break the barrier to know, know them one on one on one as two human beings. You know, aside from you know, there's there's not too many people I'm I'm intimidated by anymore. But I'm still intimidated by Sonny Rollins. I said, oh my, breaking my brain. I'm saying, oh my God, you're Sonny Rollins. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, back in L.A., it was uh, Johnny Mandel. I'm sitting with Johnny Mandel. And I'm saying, oh, my God, good Johnny Mandel. Other than that, everybody else is just a regular guy, you know. Yeah. So, you know, you, you got a chance when you were really young to see all these you know, the, these shows, and you've been around a lot. If you could get into a time machine, who would you really want to see live, like in their prime, and where would you go? Eddie Jefferson. I miss him. That's what I like. And Bobby Enriquez. I wish those guys were still around. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let me ask you this. You've dedicated your life to jazz. You've made the world a better place with your with your music. Why do you love jazz? It's me, man. It's just it's the only thing I've ever wanted to do. It's the only thing I, I really can do. I can't do a computer. I, I, can't, I can't do the books. I can't do nothing that regular people can do. I don't know nothing about IRSs or IRAs or whatever that shit is or business. I let everybody else take business, take care of business from people I trust. But, you know, I just... Um, I was born. I was born to live the jazz life. That's simple as that. Look, I, I, I had no choice. I had no choice. So let me ask you this: What's one of the nicest things that a fan has ever said to you about your music? People said a lot of nice things. <laughs> one, one time, <laughs> this, 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 this young young lady came up. She was a young lady. She's probably in her twenties. Hey, Mr. Cole, I don't know about Mr. Cole, Richie, but Richie, let me tell you something. It's it's because of you that I was born. My mom and dad <laughs> created me. But listening to your music. <laughs> <laughs> now that's pretty far, Alex. That, oh, that's, wait a minute. That, that's <laughs> deep. That is deep. <laughs> and and, and just, 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 just yesterday, I get this email from this guy in Sydney, Australia. He says, uh, I don't even know how he found me. He said, man, I'm, I was driving down the road. I heard this most beautiful song that's called If Ever I Would Leave You. And um, and uh, how do I find it? What records are on, which I couldn't think of what records are on. And he said, You're, the people in Australia love you, and we, we love your music, and we listen to you all the time. I, you know, I would have no idea that people on the other side of the world are listening to my music. That's what yeah. thrill, you know? That's, yeah. that's quite an honor. Yep. Absolutely. So let me ask you this. You know, you're far from being done, but if you had to get to a point, you lean back in your easy chair and think about your life that you've dedicated to music. How do you want all the kids and all of the people that peel back the pages and annals of jazz history to remember who you are and what you've done for the music. I would just say, look, I, I did the best with what I had to work with, and I, I, I love America's music jazz, and I tried to make it better with, in my own way, something like that. Of course, I'm gonna, on, my, on my gravestone, I already got that figured out. Here lies Richie Cole. Women ruined my life. So that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, I tell you what, Richie, I think that's, that's a, a great way to end everything right there with the perfect epitaph and thought on your career. And thank you Very for the good. music. Thank you for being raw and, and honest and giving me your stories. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Joe. We'll be in touch. Stay in touch, buddy. All right? Absolutely. Say my best to Pittsburgh. All right, man. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Richie for his cool, his music, and his time. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store, or visit the Neon Jazz channel at YouTube.com, or for all things Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy all the jazz, my friends. <laughs> Neon Jazz.